Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. What might a global Black Lives Matter movement look like? We may find out sooner than we think. Today on The Laura Flanders Show, we talk with Black Lives Matter co-founder Opal Tometi and look at Chicago's successful campaign for reparations for police torture. All that and a few words from me on patriarchal pretexts for racist killing. Welcome to our program. We talk a lot on this program about the links between extreme poverty and wealth and extreme policing of bodies and also borders. Our next guest is deeply involved in drawing those connections as well. She's Opal Tometi, a black feminist writer, communications strategist, and cultural organizer. She's also co-founder of the Black Lives Matter Network, along with Alicia Garza and Patrice Cullors, who we've had on this program. Opal is also executive director of the country's leading black organization for immigrant rights, the Black Alliance for Just Immigration. Opal, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having it's me. It's about time you complete the triad. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you are the head of the leading black immigration justice organization. Somewhere I read there weren't that many of them. There aren't. Sadly, there aren't. In a, in a nation that has um, you know, millions and millions of immigrants and 10% of those being black immigrants from Africa and the Caribbean, we're the only one that's a national organization that's working with those communities and, and doing a lot of work um, with our network of about 30 other organizations. Take us back a couple of years. Mm -hmm. Were you conscious of the fact in 2013 when you saw that Black Lives Matter post from Alicia, I think it was, that here was an opportunity to connect your issue, the issue of immigrant rights justice, immigrants' rights and justice, to the, the black justice movement in this country? Was it a conscious thing? It was absolutely conscious, yes. And I, um, when I reached out to Alicia to say, hey, I think we really need an online platform to connect our groups and connect our communities, I had in mind that it was really important that we establish a really broad notion of who is black America mm -hmm. these days, right? And a really broad notion to ensure that communities like the ones that I represent, so my parents are Nigerian immigrants, um, the communities I work with are Afro-Latinos and Caribbean and, and so on. Um, I wanted to ensure that this platform was big enough that they could also have their voice and their concerns heard. And so it was really important for us to ensure that it wasn't just a movement about uh, police killing uh, black people, yeah. but it was also about structural racism and justice for all black people. And what's, what progress do you think we've made, particularly in telling that structural story, going beyond justice for this one or incarceration for that one or make sure this cop is arrested? Um, there's a structural story, as you said. Is it getting told? I believe it is. I think it's been really difficult for our nation to really grapple with what it means to be living in um, what folks were trying to name as a post-racial kind of colorblind society and really come to terms with the fact that we're not, yeah. um, that black people have specific grievances and concerns and are really being devalued across the board. And, and what does that look like that's uh, what's happening there? So it's, where do you see the progress? So some of the progress that I'm seeing is the types of narratives that we're hearing these days. I think that different groups from the labor, industry, labor sector to immigrant rights to the LGBTQ rights community are beginning to take up issues around racial justice in ways that I haven't heard before. I'm having people approach me, you know, day in and day out saying, you know, we, we want to actually address um, the inequalities in our education system, mm -hmm. for example, in ways that folks weren't, weren't quite talking about race explicitly like they are now. And so I think the conversation has changed. And has the immigrant rights movement changed? The immigrant rights movement is changing. <laughs> <laughs> Diplomatically. It is, it's changing. Um, I think folks are really um, blown away by what they're hearing and seeing in the yeah. news. Um, the immigrant community has been suffering a great deal of backlash and hate for, for many, many years. You know, I'm from Arizona, and in many ways Arizona was kind of ground zero for anti-immigrant laws and the testing of these different types of draconian laws like SB 1070. And so I think people were fighting those types of um, pushbacks and rollbacks. And um, with that, didn't really take notice of what was happening in the broader black community. Yeah. Um, and so I think as they're seeing the killings, as they're hearing more and more stories of inequity and seeing the structural conditions 
um, of black communities. They're becoming more and more aware. And they're taking note also that there are black immigrants in, in the movement um, who also have specific issues that need to be addressed. Now, you said you're from Arizona, but Nigeria also got mentioned. Do you want to tell us your story a little bit? Yes, thank you. Um, so my parents are immigrants from Nigeria. They migrated to Arizona looking for a, you know, a better future for their children, basically, um, and for going to school. Um, and being born and raised and coming of age in Arizona, I knew really acutely the impact of racism um, on my own family, but also on my community. Awesome. So, you know, I remember many, many times my dad being pulled over by the cops. Um, being racially profiled for, you know, what we call driving while black. Mm -hmm. um, but the implications for an immigrant are quite different depending on your immigration status mm -hmm. and depending on a number of different things. And so that was a real concern for my family. Um, time and time again, we would have uh, aunts and uncles and different people in our community who were being profiled and who some of which were detained um, and some of which were deported. So have you, do you feel the international aspect of your life is being brought into this Black Lives Matter movement? Um, we talked to Patrice about going mm -hmm. to England um, and Palestine, uh, Ireland as well. She said she wanted there to be closer international ties, that this needs to be a global movement. Is it moving in that direction? I know that you were in a, a meeting of immigrant rights groups in Europe not so long ago. Yes. So it's actually happening now. And I think what's really great is that the way that we have technology these days and we're um, using social media and different tools, we're able to connect more quickly with our comrades in different parts of the world. And so we're hearing more quickly stories of what's happening in East Africa and Europe and so on in ways that we might not have heard you know, as quickly and been able to show up. And how does solidarity. that change things for you or change things for your organizing? What does it? It absolutely does, and in particular for the immigrant rights community, right? So we have a transnational commitment, quite honestly. Our families are, you know, abroad, and then we're also working and living here, right? And so there's this kind of natural inclination to, you know, keep in touch with our family, keep in touch with what's going on in terms of the politics and changing um, dynamics on the ground. And so for me, that's meant being in touch with more immigrant rights activists in places like Europe and in places like Africa. So as you mentioned, I was um, in Berlin meeting with a number of different immigrant rights organizations from across Europe. And are there particular policy positions or policies that you think give you an opportunity to talk about this, these questions, to fight? I'm thinking of trade policy, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, things like that. Yes. So I think that there are some opportunities for us to, to, to connect the dots, right? So there's the stuff that happens with our foreign policy, but there are also transnational corporations, which I think we can follow. And I'm thinking, you know, as you mentioned, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, this is a uh, international, right, a trade agreement that's in the works right, right now um, that many of our communities actually don't know much about and will actually be acutely impacted mm -hmm. by it. Um, and this is imperative that we actually name that this thing is taking place. Yeah. Um, we look at the history of transnational um, corporations and these foreign trade policies like NAFTA, so the North American Free Trade Agreement, and how that devastated yeah. our communities, not only in the United States, but abroad, right? So places like Mexico displacing six million farm workers forcing them to migrate to northern parts of Mexico and even across the border, right, to the United States, really changing the demographics, but also really undermining their own livelihood, their dignity, and their ability to stay home and be with their families. So we're talking about a very big picture, uh, and I want to ask you a little bit about your strategies of an, as an organizer when it comes to getting t people to absorb a big picture. I think the way that we do it is by being open to who it is that we really are. So I'm thinking about the Haitian immigrant community mm -hmm. that I work with right here in Brooklyn, New York, right, in Crown Heights, and how they're at the margins of the margins of even the immigrant community here, right? It's the lowest wages, right. highest unemployment, most discrimination in the workplace. But they're also witnessing some family members in the Dominican Republic 
being deported, right. right, and being dehumanized at their core. The Dominican Republic recently just withdrew citizenship status or even immigration status, residency status for Haitians, right. people of Haitian descent. Right, they're denationalizing Haitian, uh, Dominicans of Haitian descent. And we know that people here who are Haitian and their allies care about that. Yeah. We know we can't sit idly by while that's taking place. You're part of something called the, 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 the Safety Beyond Policing movement. What, yes. what is that? Tell us about that. So Safety Beyond Policing is a campaign that myself, um, members of the Black Alliance for Just Immigration, Black Lives Matter, Million Hoodies, Black Youth Project, and a number of organizations across New York City have launched. And this is a campaign that really reexamines our notions of safety um, on our terms, mm -hmm. right? So safety meaning our ability to reside in dignified communities, right? Our ability to have a good job, our ability to get mental health services and support when we need it, as opposed to what we're seeing in New York City, which is the hyper-policing of low-income communities. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes those low-income communities are black or brown. And so we're saying, let's stop criminalizing poverty. Let's stop policing poverty. Um, why don't we do things to address those challenges that our communities are having? And you having any luck inserting those metrics into a movement or into a, a moment where people are saying, well, we'll reform policing, we'll add body cameras? Mm -hmm. So what we're saying is we have to actually challenge the very notion of criminalization of our communities. And so with that, we can actually see that that take um, that happen at the very local level. So, for example, in New York City, we had a budget, um, and the city council's examining the budget, negotiating the budget, and for 170 million dollars, they could have 1,300 more police yeah. in New York City, or a whole lot of other things, or a whole lot of other things. And so, our challenge, right, is as a people to advocate for other things, other resources for our communities as opposed to police. We already have the largest uh, law enforcement in the nation and the seventh largest military is the NYPD, the way that they're militarized and weaponized. That is happening here in New York City. And so what we can do at the local level is challenge the very notion that we need more police and say we actually need a lot of other things educators, social workers, public health uh, professionals. But we lost that fight even with a progressive caucus majority inside the city council and a mayor who says he's for police reform. Right, and so that thing that happened, right, so that whole, they, they undermined that us, was. right? Um, people are now beginning to question our entire system. How can democracy play out when we didn't actually have a say in where those monies went? And that is on Bill de Blasio and the city council to account for that. I want to close by asking you about something that I read um, from Ta-Nehisi Coates recently, where he talked about the American dream. Mm -hmm. And he said the American dream is inseparable from slavery because slavery is the dream. Oh, wow. As somebody who tracks global migrations, and I'm sure the story takes you back to slavery often, um, what do you think about that? And, and how do you see us unraveling this mess that we're in? Well, it's a really profound question and a profound statement. Um, and I think the sad reality is that we do hear echoes of enslavement, um, of forced migration, of capture, of exploitation in the ways our current migration happens. Right now there are billions of people who are forced to migrate according to the United Nations. Um, this is a global occurrence and it's happening in more exponential numbers because of the ways in which economic globalization is destabilizing nations and disenfranchising local communities, making the poorest of the poor even more poor, right? Extreme poverty is forcing people to migrate across the globe. So they might be migrating to different parts of Africa, mm -hmm. they might be migrating to Europe, they might be going to the U.S. And that's happening because they're being exploited. Um, and sadly, on top of that, we're seeing the criminalization of their movement, right? And I think this really reminds me of enslavement, right, mm -hmm. of black people. It's not the exact same. I would never conflate it and say that it's the exact same. But there are elements that are there. And so for me and the work that we do with the Black Lives Matter movement and the Black Alliance for Just Immigration, we're here to really challenge the root causes of 
economic injustice, right? So the displacement of people across the globe, the gentrification that's happening even within the U.S. Mm -hmm. and in places like Brooklyn, New York, where I live, which the gentrification here, we're looking at the ways in which corporations at the local level and real estate has a hand in the criminalization of our people mm -hmm. and the policing of our people and trying to move us out from our neighborhoods in order to build more, to have new communities in there, more shops and so on. To end on a slightly different note, tell us something about what's fun. What's the most fun thing about working with Alicia Garza and Patrice Cullors and Black Lives Matter? Oh my gosh, the most fun thing about working with them is that we're a true sisterhood, right? We are learning more and more about one another and we're challenged by each other in terms of learning about who it is that we are, right? So from being queer black women to me having the roots of um, immigrant parents and being able to share more intimately like our, our upbringings. We come from really different places. And so it's just been really amazing to have this sisterhood that's gone from a very unique local kind of <laughs> occurrence and it's now having implications and flourishing across the world. Thank you so much. Thank really, you. it's great to having you on the show. Appreciate it. You can see uh, my interview with Patrice Cullors and also my interview with Alicia Garza at our website. Mm -hmm. And you'll be able to find out more about our guest, Opal Tometi, there too. Thanks. This year, the people of Chicago won a historic victory, reparations for police torture. To learn more, we spoke with two people that helped lead the campaign, torture survivor Daryl Cannon and civil rights lawyer Joey Mogul. Well, my, my hellish nightmare started November the 2nd, 1983, uh, when a, a group of all-white detectives invaded my apartment. And during the day of uh, November the 2nd, these uh, particular detectives uh, did despicable things to me uh, that no human being should have to undergo. My hellish nightmare continued for another 24 years. Since then, it's been my mission to right the wrongs that they have done with other guys who are still in prison. And because of that, I continue to speak out about the atrocities that happened to me and to others as well, uh, in hopes that they too someday will get a fair and impartial hearing. Please state your name uh, for the record and uh, share with the members of the committee any comments you might have on this matter. My name is Daryl Cannon, and I'm a survivor of having been tortured. The Burge torture cases, otherwise known as the Chicago police torture cases, involve the torture of over 100 African-American men and women in Chicago's South Side. The torture was led by former police commander John Burge and other white detectives under his command. His reign of terror lasted for two decades, from 1972 to 1991. The torture included electrically shocking people with an electric shock box and cattle prods on their genitals, ears, and lips. It included uh, using garbage bags or typewriter covers and putting it over people's heads and then kicking and punching them in the chest or stomach, forcing them to breathe out and then suck that bag in, realizing that they could have no air and that they were going to suffocate. Several individuals talk about being beaten with telephone books or blackjacks or other rubber devices that inflict severe physical pain, but like most torture tactics, leave no physical marks. And all of this torture was committed in order to extract confessions. And those confessions were then used against people in their criminal cases to wrongfully convict them, and in the case of 11, send them to Illinois' notorious death row. The torture was also very explicitly racially motivated. Almost all of the detectives who engaged in it were white. Almost all of the victims were black. A few were Latino. And the detectives throughout the interrogations called people racial epithets, racist slurs, and engaged in racist terrorism to not only inflict severe uh, intimidation and um, pain into the individuals who were being interrogated, but to intimidate their families as well as African-American communities. And I must admit, when I first heard the word reparations in association with the John Verge case, uh, I was apprehensive. 
you know, I was wondering, could this ever come about, especially here in Chicago? The reparations ordinance asked for financial compensation for the Burge torture survivors, because for so many of them, while they had complained about the torture decades ago, they were unable to sue because they were facing criminal charges at the time. And now their statute of limitations has expired. So they had no legal recourse whatsoever to get financial compensation or any other redress. So we, one thing we were demanding was financial compensation. We were also demanding that there be a psychological counseling center built on the south side of Chicago. Because we all recognize that torture inflicts um, heinous psychological scars that never go away. Now, I cry not because I hurt. I cry because I'm mad. I'm still mad today because of what happened to me. And I'll stay mad. Can't no one tell me to forgive, forget, or anything else because you do not expect for people that have a badge to treat you in that manner. Part of the reparations package was also seeking um, free enrollment in Chicago City Colleges, recognizing that the torture didn't just impact the torture survivors and their family members, but their grandchildren as well, and that this torture and the harm it inflicts has a legacy that continues to this day. Further, um, we sought that the, the reparations package and um, provide teaching about the Burge torture cases in Chicago public schools because we wanted to create this public narrative that really described these torture cases as well as the struggle for justice. And we thought that was important to memorialize and to teach about in, in, in to our, um, our, our youth. And finally, we asked for a permanent public memorial, the creation of that in Chicago. Again, to document and make this history permanent and to create a public narrative that accurately described what occurred here. We have some victims of torture here today and their families, and if they would rise when I call their names, Daryl Cannon, Ant Anthony Holmes, Prince Mundutti, Mirren Diggins, Mark Clemens, Ronnie Kitchen, and Carolyn Johnson, the mother of torture survivor, Marcus Wiggins, thank you for your, your leadership. Thank you for continuing to fight, even though you out here, you're, you've been out, you're fighting for those that are still in and for those that are still suffering. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The reparations ordinance in Chicago is the first time we've ever had reparations for law enforcement violence in, from, um, given by a city throughout the nation. And I believe it's, my, it's the first time we've ever had redress provided that was in fact called by statute reparations. And I think that's a huge victory in and of itself. That was Joey Mogul and Daryl Cannon interviewed at the Allied Media Conference in Detroit. You can get more information at our website. You rape our women and you're taking over our country, said Dylan Roof as he opened fire on African Americans in Charleston's historic AME Baptist Church, killing six black women and three men. I'm not Dylan Roof's woman. White, female, American, queer, his racist patriarchal violence does not protect me or make me safe. Nor am I the first to refute his claim that he commits murder in white women's defense. Over a century ago, Ida B. Wells Barnett debunked lies like his, reported the facts, and led a campaign to make lynching stop. Some white women were spurred to act. Jesse Daniel Ames founded the Association of Southern Women for the Prevention of Lynching, which gathered tens of thousands of signatures on a pledge that read in part, quote, public opinion has accepted too easily the claim of lynchers and mobsters that they are acting solely in defense of womanhood. We dare no longer permit this claim to pass unchallenged. That was 1930. Vigilantes have used the pretext of protecting women for my entire life. Women of color, as well as men, have perished as a result. For all that time, presidents have used the same fake pretext to launch wars of empire abroad. One thing is certain, there won't be any more mass graves and torture rooms and rape rooms, said George W. Bush after the invasion of Iraq. 
as he oversaw his own global torture regime take off. The killing of men and women of color doesn't protect me or make me safe, not abroad nor in US streets. George Zimmerman, Daniel Pantaleo, Dante Servin, you don't protect me, nor do the institutions of control with your pathological locks and jails, nor does our money media with its deadly lies about who and what pose a threat to life. The global business interests those media serve with their sick profits and stiff stomachs for other people's suffering and loss are bringing us all to the brink. Racist patriarchal killers, I know too that you seek to keep me and my sisters in our place, silent, separate, and apart from others with whom we might otherwise make common cause. I refuse. Women of all colors are refuting you. A statement is right now being finalized. If you want to sign on, write to me, laura at grittv.org, and I'll send you the sign-up information as soon as it's available. If you want to stay in touch with me, write to that same address, laura at grittv.org, and thanks. Ruth Wilson Gilmore discusses reform and revolution. There have to be other ways that we think about the problem of harm and what to do about it, and that we get away from thinking that all crime is about harm. And Monica Jones, a young transgender activist. Just going through the whole justice system is violence. Today on the show, a conversation about capitalism and white supremacy with two brilliant minds, Dr. Cornell West and Professor Rick Wolf. And Karl Marx was one of the great prophetic figures of the 19th century. The modern capitalist enterprise is the negation of democracy. And later we hear about one small business that's operating under a different economic paradigm. And it is a huge contribution to social justice work. 